This week and next week, we'll be looking at Kant's theory of sensibility, as it's presented in the Transcendental Aesthetic of the Critique of Pure Reason and in Part 1 of the Polygomena. This week, we'll be focusing on Kant's thesis that space and time are the forms of sensibility. Next week, we'll think about the claim that space and time and all the bodies in space and time are empirically real yet transcendentally ideal. But Kant lays out three theories of space and time at A23, B37. He writes, Now, what are space and time? Are they actual entities? Are they only determinations or relations of things, yet ones that would pertain to them even if they were not intuited? Or are they relations that only attach to the form of intuition alone, and thus to the subjective constitution of our mind, without which these predicates could not be ascribed to anything at all? The first of these three theories is called absolutism about space and time, and this theory is put forward by Isaac Newton. The second theory is called relation about space and time. This theory was defended by Leibniz. The first reading for today is a correspondence between Leibniz and Samuel Clark. In this correspondence, Clark defends Newton's theory of space and time. Leibniz criticizes Newton's theory and presents his own theory. On Newton's absolutist theory, space and time are prior to bodies in space and events in time. The idea here is that space is what it is independently of the bodies that occupy space. And likewise, time is what it is independently of the events that take place in time. On this view, we could think of space and time as large containers that exist and have various properties independent of whatever is put in them. Relationalism, by contrast, the view Leibniz defends, states that bodies and events are prior to space and time. On this view, bodies and events have intrinsic properties that are neither spatial nor temporal, and space and time are relational properties that supervene on the intrinsic property of the bodies and the events. Leibniz spells this out on page 45. He writes, I will here show how men come to form the notion of space to themselves. They consider that many things exist at once, and they observe in them a certain order of coexistence. This order is their situation or distance. When it happens that one of these coexistent things changes its relation to a multitude of others, which do not change their relation among themselves, and that other thing newly come, acquires the same relation to the others as the former had, we then say that it has come to occupy the place of the former. And supposing that among those coexistence there is a sufficient number of them which have undergone no change, then we may say that those which have such a relation to those fixed existence as others had to them before have now the same place which those others had, and that which comprehends all those places is called space. So the idea in this passage is that we form the idea of space first by noticing that various objects stand in distance relations among one another. By noticing how these distance relations change as the objects move, we come to form the idea of a place. So if you have three objects, A, B, and C, and if A and B stand in a certain distance relation, if B and C both move such that C now comes to stand in the same distance relation to A that B once stood in relation to A, we'll say that C occupies the same place that B previously occupied. And Leibniz's thought is that space is just the name for all the possible places. So in this way, the concept of space is consequent to the set of all the possible distance relations, which themselves are consequent to the things that stand in these distance relations. So in this way, on the relationalist view, space and time are no more than systems of relations among bodies and events that are wholly dependent on the non-spatial and non-temporal properties of those bodies and events. Now, Kant will agree with the Leibnizian relationalist that space and time are systems of relations among bodies and events. But Kant disagrees with the Leibnizian relationalist and agrees with the Newtonian absolutist that space and time are prior to the bodies and the events in space and time. The key distinction that Kant wants to draw is that for Newton and for Leibniz, space and time are mind-independent. For Newton, space and time are mind-independent entities, and for Leibniz, space and time are relations among mind-independent entities. For Kant, by contrast, space and time are mind-dependent. Space and time are forms of our capacity for intuition, and bodies and events stand in spatial and temporal relations, only in virtue of being objects of our possible sensible experience. So that's Kant's thesis. Now let's look at his arguments. Remember that Kant distinguishes the analytic method from the prolegomena and the synthetic method of the critique by saying that in the prolegomena he'll rely on mathematics and natural science containing synthetic a priori knowledge, while in the critique he won't rely on this sort of assumption. So the first premise of the prolegomena's argument is that we have synthetic a priori cognition in pure mathematics. The second premise is that this synthetic a priori cognition is possible only if we have a priori intuitions of space and time. To illustrate the role 
principle of a priori intuitions in pure mathematics, Kant asks us to consider the method of construction in geometrical proofs. So the thought here is that if we want to prove that the internal angles of a triangle sum to 180 degrees, we need to do more than reflect on the concept of a triangle. In particular, what we have to do is draw a triangle. To prove that the internal angles sum to 180 degrees, we extend the baseline, draw a parallel line to one of the legs, and observe that the internal angles of the triangle are equivalent to the three angles along this straight line. The thought here is that the method of construction gives us more than conceptual knowledge of the triangle. It gives us intuitive knowledge of it, and yet it gives us this knowledge a priori, since we come to know not just that the internal angles of the triangle we've drawn sum to 180 degrees, but that the internal angles of all triangles sum to 180 degrees. And the third premise in Kant's argument is that we can have such a priori intuitions of space and time only if space and time are the forms of intuition. It follows from this argument that space and time are the forms of intuition. Now, of course, a problem with this argument is the first premise. Does Kant have a right to assume that we have synthetic a priori cognition in pure math? Surely, this is something that the skeptic would deny. In the critique, however, Kant claims that he won't rely on this sort of assumption. So the overall structure of Kant's argument in the critique is first, he aims to show that our representations of space and time are a priori. Second, he aims to show that representations of space and time are originally intuitions. Third, he aims to show that representations of space and time could be a priori and originally intuitions, only if space and time themselves are the forms of our sensibility, from which it'll follow that space and time are the forms of our sensibility. Now notice that the third premise in this argument is the same as the third premise in the argument from the prolegomena. The key difference is that in the critique, Kant aims to argue for the first two premises, that our representations of space and time are a priori and originally intuitions, without appealing to our synthetic a priori knowledge in pure mathematics. Now the way Kant presents his arguments in the critique, he treats space and time separately, but he adduces nearly the same arguments in each case. So we'll just look at the argument in the case of space. Here, Kant adduces two considerations to show that a representation of space is a priori, and two considerations to show that a representation of space is originally an intuition. The first consideration Kant adduces in favor of the a priority of a representation of space is as follows. He writes, in order for certain sensations to be related to something outside me, that is, to something in another place in space from that which I find myself, thus, in order for me to represent them as outside and next to one another, not merely as different, but as in different places, the representation of space must already be their ground. So what does this mean? And in what sense does it show us that a representation of space is a priori? It might seem that what Kant's saying is that in order to represent spatial properties or spatial relations of things, we have to already know what space is. But this claim seems to be a tautology. It would seem to go for every other property of things. Of course, we can't represent something as having a spatial property unless we already know what space is. But just the same, we can't represent something as having a blue property unless we already know what blue is. If Kant's argument is meant to show us that a representation of space is a priori, it would seem to make every representation a priori. What Kant needs to show us is that a representation of spatial properties depends on a representation of space in a way that a representation of color properties doesn't depend on a representation of color. If we look more carefully at the text, I think we can see that Kant is directly contradicting Leibniz's relational theory of space. Recall that on Leibniz's theory, we come to the idea of space by first noticing the distance relations that objects bear to one another. Then by noticing how those distance relations change, we form the idea of a place or of the same place. And it's out of this notion of the same place that we construct the idea of space as the sum total of all the possible places. Now what Kant's saying in the aesthetic is that we can't identify objects as bearing distance relations to one another unless we actually employ a representation of space. Now here's how that differs from color. Consider, what does it take to recognize that an object is blue, or to identify one object as being bluer than another? For example, do we need to pull out a color wheel and determine where the object falls on the color wheel? Obviously, we don't. Blue is an object that we can directly read off of appearances. But Kant's thought is that space isn't like this. We can't read off of an object's properties where it is in space. We can't read off of two objects' properties 
what distance relation they bear to one another. Instead, in order to identify an object's spatial property or various objects' spatial relations, what we need to do is locate those objects in the whole of space. So in this way, a representation of the whole of space makes possible or grounds the representation of any particular object having a spatial property, or it grounds the representation of any particular objects bearing a spatial relation to one another. Now, Kant adduces a second consideration in favor of the a priori of representation of space. He writes, one can never represent that there is no space, though one can very well think that there are no objects to be encountered in it. Now this raises a variety of questions. First, why does Kant give a second consideration in favor of the a priori of a representation of space? Second, Kant phrases his second consideration in terms of what we can represent. He writes, we can never represent that there is no space, though we can think that there are no objects encountered in it. Is this meant to be a claim about what we can imagine? We can't imagine a world without space, but we can imagine a world with empty space? It would be better if Kant's claim had to do with the nature of our representation of space, as opposed to the limits of our imagination. But what is a representation of empty space? How can we tell that it's possible to represent empty space? And what would it even mean to represent that there is no space? Kant claims that we can never represent that there is no space. But what does this mean, and how can we tell? So these are some issues you might want to think about in writing your papers. Let's turn to the second premise in Kant's argument, the premise that a representation of space is originally an intuition. So first, what originally means here is that while of course we do have a concept of space, and moreover, we have various concepts of different places in space. These concepts couldn't have been our first representation of space. Instead, our first representation of space has to be an intuition, not a concept, and that whatever concepts we have of space must somehow derive from this first intuition of space. Now Kant aims to support this premise by pointing out that a representation of space has two properties that only intuitions have and concepts cannot have. The first property is that space is essentially single, and the second property is that space has has infinitely many parts in it. Regarding the singularity of space, Kant explains that there is and can be only one space. Of course, there are many parts of space, but Kant's claim is that space cannot be the simple sum of all of the various parts of space. Instead, the parts of space must be limitations of the one all-encompassing space. Right, so the thought is, the one all-encompassing space precedes all of the various places in it, rather than all of the various places preceding the one all-encompassing space, and the one all-encompassing space being the sum of all of these preceding spaces. In writing your paper, you should think about whether these claims are true, and if so, what makes them true? And moreover, if these claims are true, how does that show us that space is an intuition and not a concept? The second feature of space that Kant points out in order to show us that space is an intuition and not a concept is that space has an infinity of parts in it. Kant's thought here is that concepts could have infinitely many instances under them. So one example here would be the concept of a natural number. There are infinitely many instances of this concept, insofar as there are infinitely many natural numbers. But Kant thinks that space isn't infinite in this way. There aren't infinitely many instances of the concept of space. Instead, Kant thinks there are infinitely many parts in space. If we think about concepts for a minute, Kant thinks that complex concepts have simpler concepts in their definitions. So for example, the concept of a peninsula is defined as a body of land bordered on three sides by water. So within this concept of a peninsula, we have the simpler concepts of a body of land and being bordered on three sides by water. Now, consider, could a concept be infinitely complex? That is, could a concept have infinitely many simpler concepts in it? I think not. Now Kant's claim is that space is infinitely complex in this sense. There aren't merely infinitely many instances or examples of space, but there are literally infinitely many places in space. Okay, so now the third premise in Kant's argument in the critique is that if our representations of space and time are a priori and originally intuitions, they must be the forms of our sensibility. This premise is common to the argument in the critique and in the prolegomena. And in the prolegomena, Kant offers a bit more elucidation. Kant explains that intuitions depend on objects being immediately present to us. In empirical intuitions, objects are present to us immediately by affecting our senses. The question is, how could objects be immediately present to us a priori? 
How could objects be immediately present to our senses other than by affecting our senses? Kant's thought is that the only way an object could be immediately present to us other than by affecting our senses empirically is if it were the form of our faculty of sensibility. If space is the form of our faculty of sensibility, then it's immediately present to our sensibility in the way that intuitions must be, and yet it is a priori, independent of any objects actually affecting our sensibility. Here, then, is a complete overview of Kant's argument in the critique for the conclusion that space and time are forms of our sensibility. What I want you to do in your papers for this week is evaluate this argument by picking out what you think is the most contentious premise. Try to understand how Kant aims to substantiate and defend the premise, and consider to what extent you think he is successful.